There's much, many worse things than death to be terrified of. Like insanity is probably one, you know. Pain, that's a bad one. Long-term pain, that's a bad one. Well, then there's long-term pointless pain, you know. Then there's your long-term pointless pain and that of your family. Like there's, there's horrors that exceed death by orders of magnitude. So, to make that the fundamental fear, I think is, I think that's an error. You know, it's like, are people more afraid of dying or having their children die? You know, that's, that's a perfectly reasonable question. So, I read Becker. Really read him. Like, I like Becker's book. It's brilliant, but he makes a bunch of mistakes. For one of the things he does, for example, is right in the intro he says, it's a book that's trying to bring about the psychoanalytic closure of the study of religion. So it's neo-Freudian, smartly neo-Freudian. And he wants to explain religion pretty much completely within the psychoanalytic framework. He does a great job. But in the intro he says, well you might wonder why in a book that's devoted to the last word in psychoanalytic thinking about religion, I never mention Jung. So then he says a bunch of things about Jung. One of them is, I could never understand a single thing he was talking about when he wrote all his works on alchemy. It's like, oh well, that's a problem, because that's where all the information that your book lacks is. All of it. You missed it. It's like, yeah, you're thinking about the hero myth, for example, as a delusion. And, you know, as a hero project, and as something that's only there to stave off the fear of death. It's like, well, you got a good way into the depths, but and way farther than most people get, but you missed the next 300 stories. So, and that's too bad. So, you know, and it's funny because I've also read the social psychology, a fair bit of it, that is associated with terror management. And most of the problem with it is, is it hasn't moved Becker one inch. It's like, yeah, that's what Becker said. So we're proving it. Well, no, not really, because the demonstrations are amenable to multiple interpretations. But Becker, he covered it. I mean, it's a brilliant book, but it's wrong. So, right. So on, on that note, is, uh, this argument is wrong in what way for people that may not have read Becker, they're not fully aware of the terror management theory. Well, because he, th th he thinks of everything that we do to contend with mortality as a ruse, you know, and I don't think that's right. Because I don't think that it's necessary to be terrified of death. Now, it's not easy not to be, but, you know, it's fate that, as far as Becker's concerned, is that that's what you're going to be terrified of. It's like, well, I don't think that that's right. I think that people don't have to be terrified of death. It's not an easy state to achieve. It's not like I want to die, although I can certainly imagine things that are worse than that, like no problem. So I think, and this is something Solzhenitsyn laid out in the Gulag Archipelago too, I think there are ways of living that are worse than death. That's why people commit suicide. That's their decision. So obviously hell is worse than death, you know, given how I described it earlier. So it isn't death that's the problem, it's complexity that's the problem. It's that things are beyond us. And because of that, they always exceed what our models tell us they're going to do, or they always transform themselves in some ungainly way so that we don't get what we want. So then the question is, well, how do you best deal with complexity? And the reason I think truth is so useful is because generally it reduces complexity, right? Well, I mean, one of the things that's really useful about trying to say things that you believe to be true is you don't have to remember what you said. It's like, well, what did I say? Well, I don't know, but I was trying to explain things properly. Then you don't have to tear through all your rationalizations and think about what you have to keep track of. Like deceptions, they grow, you know, they're like hydras. So, well, don't do that, okay? Truth, simpler. That's one big advantage. You know, and people can say, well, truth isn't always the answer. Well, there are sometimes you get into a situation that's so awful, you've made so many mistakes that not only would it be very difficult for truth to rescue you? You've already warped your character to such a degree that you couldn't even use it. Well, you've had it. 
you know, you're, you're off the radar at that point, and nothing short of a miracle would save you. To what degree do you think that, one, the lessons that you've extrapolated and you've put, in, and you've put into, into words are, are easily applied across various cultures that you may not have necessarily addressed in your examination of mythology, right? And I'm challenging you a little bit here, mm-hmm. just, just because it's an interesting topic. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, this Islam just doesn't feature at all in the work that, that you've written, as I've, as I've mm-hmm. written, but it's, 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 it's a hugely important religion on a global scale, mm-hmm. and even in countries like Canada. Um, and then there's also the question of, with so many people coming with different... Um, specific mythologies or embodiments of the universal mythology that we're discussing, what are the, I mean, this is sort of a unique episode in human history in the sense of just the scale and the rapidity with which people are coming into contact with each other from very different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. So what do you see as the implications of that, for good or for bad, in, uh, in a country like Canada? Okay, wait, you mean the fact that people are coming together? Coming together, or? but from those very different cultural places in which... Maybe there's a universal mythology that, that envelops all of them, but the values and the particular embodiments of the mythology that people have grown up with are often very different, and they and mm-hmm. and these and these come these can clash. I mean, I'm not a right. not a tribal. They clash tribally and right yeah. tribally. Not, not, mm-hmm. I, I don't mean in a, in a in the clash of civilizations sort of overblown way, but I'm just saying on a on a pragmatic level, people are often mm-hmm. operating in different psychological space. Yeah, the, well, to some degree, the, the issue there is whether or not you can negotiate, right? Because that a society, a multicultural society, in many ways is dependent on negotiation. And, and you know, we, here's another sort of axiom. It's like tyranny, slavery, and negotiation. Those are your options. You want to be a tyrant? Fine. You want to be a slave? That's an option. But if you don't want to be either of those, you negotiate. Okay, so how do you negotiate? Well, partly, you pay attention. So you listen. And so another, here's another way to think about it. It's like the totalitarian assumes that what he does will redeem him. It's sort of the basis of terror management theory in some sense, right? So that what you know protects you and keeps you safe. Okay. And so you want to tighten that up and you want to make it rigorous and you don't want anything to exist outside of it. Okay. Another, so, so in some ways you worship the great father. That's a way of thinking about it. Here's another way of thinking about it. What you don't know will redeem you. Well, why? Because you already know what you know. And now then you can ask yourself, well, is that enough? And then that, the answer to that is, well, what's the quality of your life? If the quality of your life is what you want it to be, really, then what you know is enough. But the probability that your quality of life is what you want it to be is very low, because you're still prone to all sorts of suffering and all sorts of ignorance. And, and you know, you can face that forthrightly. It's one of the things that didn't happen in the Soviet Union, because everybody said, my quality of life is great, we know everything we need to know, when in reality it was like abysmal, murderous, treacherous, deceitful. It was horrible, but, you know, so what that meant was that in the Soviet Union, if you admitted toward, if you admitted to your own suffering, you were a traitor. Well, that's the, that's hell. So you can't even let your suffering be true, right? Not only do you have to suffer, but you can't even admit it. Okay, so back to listening. It's like, well, if you assume that what you don't know is redemptive, then you can listen. You can listen because you never know. That person might know something that you don't know. And maybe that would be a useful something. You know, and maybe you have something to say that they don't know that would be useful. You know, now there's some presuppositions that go along with that. It's like you have to be willing to meet the other person in the space between cultures. And you have to know how to operate in the space between cultures. And that's part of the hero myth, by the way. If you're a hero of the right form, you know how to operate in the space between cultures. Well, then how do you operate there? Well, I think we know. What makes cultures rich? Trust. What makes trust possible? Honesty. You know, you want natural resources? There's nothing more valuable than trust and honesty. Why is the world poor? Corruption. That's why. All the poor countries, almost all the poor countries are corrupt. Part of the reason they're poor is because they're corrupt. Now, you know, you might say, well, are the Western countries so uncorrupt? It's like, well, they've got their problems, but generally the answer is 
they're not corrupt. So you, eBay is a good example of that. You know, because when eBay first emerged, people thought, you send me junk and I send you a check that bounces. So that's the end of eBay, right? So these third party, I can't remember what they're called, agents set themselves up so that you could pay them a fraction of the price and they would get the check and the product, validate them and ship them off. And you know, they'd take 10% or whatever. There's a particular name for people who do that, like it's a profession. Anyways, what happened was the average rate of honesty on eBay was so high that that was useless. It's like the default was, I won't screw you. And that was between strangers who had never met and even more weirdly were never going to engage in another transaction. So what that meant was that eBay all of a sudden became insanely valuable because people would trade property. Now re reputation markers soon evolved. But the D and I do believe that in the West, the default is you won't screw me. Now, if, and that means that I can trust your persona. If the default is you will screw me, then I'm a barrel of snakes and you're a barrel of snakes and we will never get anywhere. Exactly, but this is, I mean, if, 